my respected brothers and sisters in Islam. Several weeks ago, if you remember, basically the last time we spoke about the life lessons from the Prophet's biography, I reminded you of the mission that began to emerge from Darul Arqam. That lended space, donated space to the Prophet ﷺ, very close to the sanctuary on the opposite side of Mount Safa. The Prophet ﷺ began teaching faith, which would lead to sincere worship. Teaching faith, sincere worship in order to strengthen the community. We talked about the many great success stories. Success stories of conversions. We all love to hear a good convert story. And guess what? The companions' lives, they're all convert stories. If that's your thing, look no further. Learn about the lives of those around the Prophet والسلام, and you will read magnificent stories of conversion, of transformation. But with those successes and joys, there were also frustrations and what many would consider personal losses. Personal losses along the way. As Islam began to take root in the community, it began to draw very clear lines of division. And sometimes those lines of division, they went straight down the middle of a household. One such example was Nofal ibn Khuwaylid ibn Asad, known as ibn al-Adawiyya. It's the half-brother of Khadija, radiallahu anha. Nofal ibn Khawailid. We know Khadija bint Khawailid. While her mother was Fatima, the mother of Nofal was known as Al Adawiyah. Khadija, like any God fearing believer, would want, she desperately desired that her family, all of them together, would embrace Islam and follow the Prophet to their own salvation. Each and every one of us has a desire for those that we care for and those that we love to receive the same goodness found in faith that we have. Nofel, her half-brother, he was a noble warrior. He was known by his tribe to be a champion. They called him Asad al Quraysh. He was the lion of the tribe. He was big, strapping man, strong. Instead of joining his sister, the wife of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Something to be said about that. Like the very household of the leader of the faithful, he became one of the most violent enemies of the messenger and those that followed that message. Around the time of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he was inviting people to Islam, Talha ibn Ubaidillah was in Basra. You know, the, the trade routes went up to that part of the world. And he was out there with the caravan of people. And one of the monks in the hermitage, we've discussed the role of the monks in the history of Islam, in, in shedding light on the prophet's message and messengership, he saw this group of businessmen and he asked if there was anyone from Al-Haram present from the sanctuary in Mecca. When he asked Talha, he, he said, I'm from the Haram, I'm, meaning I came from Mecca. And so the monk asked Talha if Ahmed had come forward. And he said, Ahmed who? He said, Ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib, the son of Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib, talking about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And of course, 
Talha was unaware of such a coming. So the monk said, it is in this month that he will come out. That he will make himself known and go public. And so you should go back so that you don't miss out on that. And so Talha quickly returned back to Mecca. And when he got to Mecca, he asked the people if anything had happened. It's basically what's going on. What did I miss while I was absent? And they said that Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib has basically shared some news with the community. And we know that news. And he said, <laughs> That I'm a warner, warning you of a torment just around the corner. And they said as well that Ibn Abi Quhafa is following him. Ibn Abi Quhafa is Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Remember the first to, to embrace Islam from the men of the tribe. And so he went looking for Abu Bakr. And he got to Abu Bakr and he said, Look, tell me what's going on. Are you following this man? And Abu Bakr said that he followed him and took him quickly to the Prophet's house. Alayhi salatu was salam. On the way, Talha began to explain what he heard from the monk. They arrived to the house of the Prophet and he asked the Prophet to tell him what was going on and what this news was and so the Prophet explained to him the message of Islam and so Talha embraced Islam along with Abu Bakr as Siddiq and then they went out. No fell. When he heard about this, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and now Talha, when he heard about both of them, he went after them, grabbed them both, and bound them together with a single rope. He tied them together so that they could not perform any types of worship. He tied them up. The two of them became, became known as Al-Qarinayn. Right? They became known, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and Talha ibn Ubaidullah became known as the two that were attached together by Nofet. He became, once was, Asad Quraysh became known as Shayateen Quraysh because of that. He became known as a Shaytan. And he continued like this to torment, and to abuse, to oppose the Prophet ﷺ. And it continued until after the migration when he would face the Muslims at the Battle of Badr. And we know the Prophet ﷺ going into such battles used to make dua. Raise his hands and supplicate and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them victory. And sometimes he would be very specific. He says, Allahumma kfina sharr ibn al-Adawiyya. He says, Oh Allah, suffice us from Ibn Adawiyya's evil. From Nawfal ibn Khuwaylid. Basically, remove his evil from our path. And the battle began. Began with the traditional standoff or the duel. There were three from the Muslim community and three from the, the, the opposition, the enemies. And the Muslims were successful in that duel. And Nofel, he witnessed that. And when he saw his tribesmen slain, he began to yell out in a loud voice, Today is the day of supremacy. It is the day of eminence trying to rally the troops after taking a severe loss. He's trying to rally them that we will be victorious. We will walk out. We will walk away supreme. And then the battle began. And as you know, the outcome of the battle was a huge victory for the Muslims. And when that was beginning to become apparent to Nawfal ibn Khuwaylid, he called out to the, to the Ansar. Right? The Ansar were not their real enemies. The enemies were... The, the Muhajirun, those that left from their own tribes. They were, they were really after them. And the Ansar, and he said, what do you need of our blood? Have you not spilt enough of it? And then one of the soldiers, Al-Jabbar, captured Nawfal. He began to kind of steer him in front of him. Nawfal saw a man coming off from the distance heading directly for him, and he said, Oh, my brother from the Ansar, there's somebody running at me. It's as if they want me. 
And he said, that's Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Ali ibn Abi Talib came right up to Nofal to stand him down. Ali reaches for his sword and it's stuck in the sheath. Manages to pull it out and he strikes Nofal's legs out from underneath him. Falling to the floor. So much for supremacy and eminence. And Ali finished him off right there. At the end of the battle, the Prophet ﷺ said, Does anyone know about Nofal? Does anyone have any news of Nofal ibn Khuwailid? And Ali informed him that he killed Nofal in battle. And the Prophet ﷺ began to say, Allahu Akbar. All praises to Allah who answered my supplication against him. And like that, one of the greatest enemies of the Prophet ﷺ and enemies of Islam was killed. At the same time, he was still the half-brother of Khadija who remained behind. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب استغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم بسم الله والحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيك كما يحب ربنا ويرضى ونصلي ونسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين you know, stories like this haunted the companions. Even the Prophet ﷺ had loved ones that refused to embrace and follow God's truth. Even the Prophet ﷺ had family members and loved ones that refused to enter into Islam. It's a very tough predicament to be in. Think about Khadija and Nofal. Just for a moment, Nofel, who she hoped would embrace the truth and follow the Prophet ﷺ, became known as Min Shayatin al Quraysh. How do we deal with close family and friends that refuse God? Think about it for a minute. Each and every one of us have those same stories, we have those same people in our lives. Try and picture them in your mind right now. You're going to need to hold on to that picture shortly. It could be a parent. It could be a spouse. It could even be a child. The wayward sons and daughters of our community. It could be a friend. It could be a sibling. It could be a close co-worker or a neighbor. That they just simply refuse God. They refuse God's truth. They refuse faith. How do we handle that? How do we cope with that? The first thing, we must surrender to the fact that true transformative change is not in our hands. It's not even in their hands. True transformative change is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَالَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا سُمٌّ وَبُكْمٌ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ He says, those that deny our verses are deaf and dumb within darkness. مَنْ يَشَاءِ اللَّهُ يُضْلِلْهُ وَمَنْ يَشَاءِ يَجْعَلْهُ عَلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Whoever Allah wills, he leaves them astray. And whoever he wills, he puts him on a straight path. You see, the light of guidance is a gift. It's a gift that cannot be stolen. It cannot be forced. It has to be given. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even telling his prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, innaka la tahdi man ahbabt. You do not guide who you love. Walakin Allah yahdi man yasha'. Indeed, it is Allah that guides whomever He wills, and He is more knowing of the rightly guided. Surah Al-Qasas, verse 
verse number 56. Meaning that Allah knows who deserves to be guided and who deserves to be misguided. You know, this verse was according to both collections of Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim, their hadith collections. This particular verse, إِنَّ كَلَا تَحْدِ مَنْ أَحْبَبْتِ إِنَّ كَلَا تَحْدِ مَنْ أَحْبَبْتِ You do not guide who you love, but Allah guides whom He wills. This was revealed for his uncle Abu Talib. Even the Prophet ﷺ could not guide Abu Talib, who loved the Prophet ﷺ, who stood by him, supported him even during the hard years of the mission, all the way up until his death. And the Prophet ﷺ was right there at his deathbed, encouraging and urging him to say, La ilaha illallah, just say one time, so that I will have something in your defense with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yawm al-qiyamah. Abu Talib just could not get it out because it can't be forced. It has to be given. If the Prophet ﷺ couldn't guide his own uncle, couldn't have him convert to the faith, what about us? What should we do with the loved ones and the family members, those we care for, that just refuse God. Seems like a hopeless task, doesn't it? Sometimes it's met with frustration and anger. Sometimes we even give up. If we can't change people's hearts, then, then what is it that we can do? It's two things. You have two things. And that's it. Da'wah and du'a. And this is where you need to be. Because this is where the Prophet wasallam was. Da'wah, invitation, and du'a, supplication. One of the great companions, his name was Abu Hurairah. It's a very beautiful story. It's a hopeful story. After we heard the story of Ibn Khuwaylid, the story of Abu Hurairah was that he was inviting his mother to become Muslim. She was an idolater. And he would call her to Islam. He would teach her about Islam and ask her to convert. Until one day she said something terrible about the Prophet wasallam To him. It's bound to happen. And he went to the Prophet wasallam and he, he told him what occurred. He said, look, I've been trying to convince my mother to join us in faith. And then she said something about you that, that drove me to tears. And then he asked the Prophet wasallam to pray. He said, please ask Allah to guide the mother of Abu Hurairah, to guide her heart. And so the Prophet wasallam he stood up and he began to pray. And he asked Allah to guide the heart of his mother, Abu Hurairah's mother. So Abu Hurairah, when he heard that supplication, he became extremely happy, overjoyed that the Prophet ﷺ would pray for him and his mother. I mean, because essentially, a prayer for your family member to be guided is a prayer for you, the one who loves their guidance. So he went back home. And as he got close to home, his mother was inside and she heard him coming. He went to the door and found that it was shut from inside and he knocked on the door and his mother said, just give me a minute. Abu Hurairah said, I heard water, the sound of water. His mother was inside making a ghusl. She put her gown on and covered her head and she opened the door and she said, my son Abu Hurairah, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah And she embraced Islam. Da'wah and du'a. Abu Hurairah overjoyed with that. He ran back to the Prophet ﷺ. And he told him what had happened. And when he got home, such and such happened and his mother had embraced Islam. And then he asked for another favor of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, please ask Allah 
that after you've got, he has guided my mother in such a way that the hearts of the faithful will be filled with love for her and I. And Abu Huraira later reported and said that there was not a Muslim that met or heard about us, my mother and I, except that their hearts were filled with love for us. Brothers and sisters, while we have to be prepared to accept the outcome of Khadija and her half-brother, Nawfal ibn Khuwaylid, they are sad stories. There's no doubt about it. No, there's no doubt about it. We have to be prepared to accept those stories and live with the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we should never lose hope. We should never lose hope in that loved one that seems stuck in their ways. We should never lose hope in that loved one that seems as if they'll never come around. I can never win them over. They'll never be convinced. We have to keep hope in such stories as Abu Huraira and others throughout the history of our tradition so that we stay the course with both da'wah and du'a. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide our hearts and the hearts of those that we love and care for, that he fill them with his light never to be extinguished. We ask that he guide our parents and our spouses, our children and our friends. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieve us of our burdens and make the road to paradise easy. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa akhru da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.